Um, one of the most popular methods of data collection is through um, using a survey. Uh, again, this is one of um, not experimental designs, um, also sometimes called correlational method of data collection. Um, it is correlational in nature because any findings using this method can only tell us about the um, if there is association between the variables um, of interest, uh, but they cannot tell you, the study cannot tell you whether um, there's a causal relationship. Now, surveys can be used um, as the only method of data collection or in essentially mixed designs, for example, in combination with observations or experimental uh, methods. Surveys can be conducted in person, for example, on in-person interviews, um, by phone, um, through mailing a questionnaire, um, or by conducting it online. Today, many surveys are conducted online using such popular platforms as Qualtrics, for example. <clears throat> and of course, the reason why online surveys are becoming most more popular is for its convenience and um, efficiency, um, cost effectiveness. So as I mentioned earlier that surveys are very common in um, social sciences uh, and the strength and popularity of this, of this method um, can be attributed to several things. Um, well, first, um, there are survey researchers, um, there are survey researchers can reach a lot more people and a lot more faster. So they can um, essentially survey studies tend to have larger samples. And so more data can be collected um, on, on more people. Uh, second, survey can potentially allow researchers gather more insight into the phenomena of interest by essentially asking, directly asking people what they want to know. They ask, um, you could ask people's uh, opinions, beliefs, attitudes, um, and all of it again can be done relatively easy and quick. But of course, as you already learned, surveys do have their weaknesses or shortcomings. Comings. Just as any correlational research, surveys tend to have weaker internal validity. Uh, remember that an internal validity is your ability to draw causal um, inferences. So the internal validity is relatively weak, uh, weaker um, in the survey study. Uh, another potentially serious issue um, with the survey is the response rate, um, and which uh, can lead to selection um, bias if you have a low response rate. The survey response rate is the uh, essentially simply the number of people in the sample who actually completed the survey, either either electronically or by successfully submitting the answers, um, mailing them back or responding to a phone call. Uh, it is believed that low response rate may affect the um, essentially the external validity of a study. And that is remember that external validity is your ability to generalize your results to the population of interest. And, and the reason why is of course, if few people respond to the survey, um, it affects the representativeness of the population of this, the, to, to, to extent to which the sample represents the actual population of interest. And so if your representativeness uh, <clears throat> is low, uh, it, that, if your sample does not um, represent accurately the population, then your generalization, your ability to generalize your results is low as well. Um, Non-response bias is when characteristics of the people who com actually complete the survey may differ systematically from those who do not complete the survey. And that is, in, that is a serious issue and it does actually um, lower the internal validity uh, of, your, of the study. Now, an acceptable response rate may vary from 60 to 80%. Um, another potential issue with a survey, with a survey as a method of data collection, is um, that some potentially some um, answers may not be truthful or accurate. Um, of course, it's not always the case, and there are ways that um, all of those issues can be um, resolved to some extent. So. 
So let's talk about ways to increase first your external validity. Well, one way to increase uh, res uh, response rate is to consider a multi-mode multi approach to survey um, as a data collection, which is to say to use a combination potentially uh, electronic and maybe um, uh, mailed in questionnaires. Um, it's uh, the, some studies suggest that that in fact does increase your response rate. Another useful strategy is simply to do a follow-up by either mailing or emailing your um, the non-respondents and to simply remind them about the, completing the survey. So that also tends to um, increase um, survey response rate. And of course, incentives. Incentives that do help uh, monitor or non-monitor. So you could, some surveys offer a gift card or uh, other um, potential incentives, and they do tend to boost um, survey response rate. Um, so the way to increase your internal validity, there are several ways. Well, the first thing is like in, in any um, research project, you have to first start with the clear research goals, identify your, your, um, your goals, um, what determine your hypothesis, um, and of course the study variables. That's essentially the first step in any research uh, process. Once you identify what variables you need to measure, then the important step um, is to choose appropriate and validated survey instruments to measure your variables. Validated instruments are those that have been extensively tested in prior studies. Um, just, and that's almost like common sense. If your measures are not good, then the, the entire data is um, not uh, going to be, um, have any value. So um, using validated instruments is extremely important. Now, the quality of an instrument or an instrument or scale can be evaluated based on the following criteria. And we could broadly uh, talk about reliability and validity. First, let's talk about reliability. Well, um, scale reliability is essentially the uh, consistency or the degree to which the scale um, measures the same way uh, the construct that it is designed to measure. So it's the consistency of the measures. Just imagine if you using um, a, a weight scale to measure your weight, uh, you expect that relatively speaking, if you measure, um, if your weight does not change, if your weight's um, if you don't, if you didn't gain weight or you didn't lose weight, then if you uh, measured your weight throughout the day, it tends to, it should remain kind of the same, right? Um, so that's what we talk about the reliability. Um, reliability, um, we already actually talked about uh, reliability when we um, covered content analysis and observational methods uh, where um, you've learned about the importance of inter-rated reliability, essentially um, the, the how consistently uh, similar um, the uh, coding, for example, if we talk about content analysis, is between the two or more coders, right? So it's the agreement between the coders or observers. So that's all, essentially it's the same idea, the reliability, inter-rate reliability. Test, re test, retest reliability is, this, is what I, I mentioned in, in when it comes to um, reliable instrument is when you test, when you retest the same, um, using the same measure, uh, using the same instrument measure to measure the same construct it should provide if it should you should get the same score or the measure of that construct that's the reliability um validity um is a different um but also important characteristics of a scale um, it is the degree to which it measures the scale actually measures or represents the construct that it is designed to measure um, Again, if we use the same example with the weight scale, uh, the, the weight scale should in fact measure your weight and nothing else, right? Um, there are several ways that we um, assess validity or the validity of an instrument can be assessed. But one thing that I do wanna 
point out is that uh, an instrument could have <clears throat> high reliability but low validity and vice versa. An instrument could have high validity but low reliability. Those two uh, concepts, the um, qualities, reliability and validity are different, again, characteristics of a scale. So the, I mentioned validity, going back to validity of a scale is essentially, there are many, several ways that you could assess that through face validity, criterion uh, related validity and construct related uh, validity. So face validity is, refers to validity on its face value. In other words, it's, it's whether the scale on its face um, appears to measure the construct. Um, so for example, if you want to measure how often someone spends time playing video games and you're asking your respondents to rate the frequency of video game playing um, on the scale of zero to seven, um, does this, is this a good way on its face uh, value, value to um, represent uh, frequency of playing video games? Reasonably, generally speaking, that should be a reasonable measure. Now, two ways that criterion related validity can be assessed. First, measuring the concurrent validity, which is uh, the relatedness of the scale to um, essentially similar scale measured concurrently. Um, well, to give a more concrete example, say you have um, developed a new scale to measure moral uh, judgment. Um, say this is a shorter instrument. Um, now to validate it um, concurrent, using concurrent validity, you could um, give this newly developed instrument to your respondents. And then you also give them the old version of an instrument and you compare the scores. Um, because both scales, both, both instruments should represent respondents' moral judgment, then the score should be the same, right? Relatively speaking. So that's would that would be your measure of concurrent validity. Um, concurrent validity can be measured by comparing scores of another similar say um, test. So say a test of moral sensitivity and moral judgments, even though they're not exactly the same thing, but theoretically speaking, you may decide that, that this is, again, based on the theory that moral judgment and moral sensitivity are very related constructs and the score should be also relate correlated. Um, a predictive validity refers to how well the instrument can predict future behavior or performance um, of the subjects. Um, again, this should be based on a theory. Um, and so, for example, the scores obtaining on moral judgment instrument uh, should predict subjects actual moral behavior. So if you could measure both subjects moral judgment and moral behavior and then compare um, and see how well the moral judgment test in fact predicts this, the subjects moral behavior. The construct validity refers to how well the scale measures the construct it, it is designed to measure. Now you can assess this, assess it at least two different ways by measuring its discriminant validity or how well the scale can actually discriminate from another theoretically unrelated um, or, or distinct construct. Uh, so for example, suppose a researcher developed an instrument to measure the effect of sadness. So the sadness um, is different from, let's say, feeling depressed. And so the scores on sadness instrument should be distinctly different from the scores on depressed test, right? So if you administer, if you give the um, instrument measuring sadness to your subjects, to your respondents, and then you also measure depression using a different scale, um, the two scales should not be they're not, this should not represent, this should be, they should differ, right? Because the sadness should be distinct, at least based on say uh, a newer theory uh, from depression. So um, the score sh should be distinctly different. A conversion validity is essentially the opposite of discriminant validity. And that is to say that um, the, again, based on the theory that um, 
you may, um, again, let's say if you developed an instrument measuring hopelessness, um, now to show its convergent validity, you might want to compare the scores obtained on the hopelessness test and the scores on depression of the same subjects. And their scores should be correlated because again, based on the theory, um, depression tends to be related to feeling of hopelessness. And so you should expect to have um, to have um, a positive correlation um, between the two uh, scores. Now, in addition to choosing valid and reliable instruments, researchers must ensure that all questions on, survey, on the survey are well constructed. They also should be ordered properly. And um, also the aesthetics of your survey should ma matter as well. Um, it should be pleasing aesthetically and overall um, relatively easy to complete. So let's talk about aesthetics a little bit. Aesthetics, aesthetically pleasing survey will help um, sustain respondents' attention and interest in the survey. And that's important. You want, again, to increase your response rate. Um, and so you want to make sure that your respondents are interested um, and maintain that interest. The order of the questions also matter and can help again with that um, maintenance of your of respondents' attention to your questions and increase your response rate as well. So generally speaking, easier and also important questions should be placed at the beginning. Um, now, some group common theme questions should be grouped together and placed somewhere in the middle and demographic questions typically are placed at the end of the survey. Um, then questions themselves make sure they have to be clearly um, stated, easy to understand and free of any types of biases. Now, there are also um, the researchers should be aware of some of the what we consider bad questions. Um, avoid double barrel questions. So those are questions that to, would have two questions in one, but only one single response. So for example, if you ask your subjects, if you like traveling, where do you like to travel? So essentially you asking you lumping two questions in one, do you like traveling and where do you like to travel? But you only provide them with one type of answer. So that is not a good, question. It's a double barrel question. Avoid loaded questions. So those are questions with some sort of built in assumptions. Uh, for example, if you ask your um, respondents, what did you what did you study in college, you're already assuming that all of them went to college, uh, which in fact may not be this true. So that is, um, in fact, uh, loaded questions and you should avoid those. Typically, um, absolutes yes, no questions are not ideal. So do you like traveling? Yes or no. And that is because they're usually, you know, a lot of uh, um, answers uh, can be easier to answer if you give uh, people um, degrees or options, multiple options, right? So it's never no and every completely yes, so um, perhaps a more accurate answer would be some sort of some degree of um, to what degree you like traveling, how much do you like traveling? Thank you.